This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. In the world of dentistry, there are teeth and then there are teeth. Our guest today, Dr. Martin Nouia, a dentist, is also a dentist to the marine animal with the largest tooth, the narwhal. Welcome to Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. Martin, I've got to ask you right off the bat, is it narwhal or narwhal? Uh, Richard, great to be with you. It can be either, whatever your preference. I say narwhal, uh, and I've always wondered, you know, why no E? So, um, but the uh, Danes decided that it should be without the E. It's the only whale without the E, but most of us uh, in English speaking countries just say narwhal. So let, let's get right to the fact that it is a whale. Um, you know, many people have attributed this creature to the unicorn, that its, that its large tooth or tusk would have led people during say the middle ages to believe this actually came from a horse with a, a, a large horn coming out of its nose. Yeah, and you have to wonder after seeing the whale why they would have to go to the myth when you have something even more extraordinary living on the planet with you, right? But yeah. uh, go ahead. And so I, I, you know, back to your dentistry, it almost seems um, ironic or kind of funny. I mean, your, your patients must know that you're the world's expert on this particular tooth. It, it must, you must have ensuing conversations. I mean, what's, what's the, the, the first question people usually ask you? Well, people are very curious. And I think the connection is, you know, why or how did you get interested? You know, I, I think that's, that's the most common one. Um, and I just tell them, you know, the basic answer is I've always been a curious kid. And in the world of teeth, this is about as curious as you get. So when people think of teeth, you know, you might look at a hippopotamus, which has really big teeth or human teeth, but somehow this is very straight and it, and it almost looks like a weapon. But I, I know within your research, you found out that this is a lot more complex uh, an appendage to, to these uh, beautiful creatures. Yeah, it is a lot more complex. And indeed, as I described to people, it defies every principle and property of evolution of teeth I ever learned about in dental school. So knowing it was more complex, we looked for a little different kind of solution that the whale may have had to its environment. And indeed we found it was sensory. And so when you say it's sensory, sen <laughs> sensory this is, is, is it used for hunting, for, for mating? Do the females have it? I mean, very few people, you know, you, you're immersed in the world of nor whales or walls. You know, tell me something about this creature and tell me what it uses this for. So we don't have enough behavioral data to say for sure what its use is. And I always tell people, you know, we're a blink of an eye in evolution, right? So we don't know if this is a trait being phased in or being phased out, um, but it's likely linked to sexual selection, but even its expression is completely odd. You know, like you said, most males have it and most females don't, but some females do have it and some males don't. So it's not a very clear distinction between the sexes. Um, but it's likely linked to sexual selection. Perhaps these males um, can detect the kind of salinity of water of the food that uh, young narwhal calves may want. You know, it's, it's hard to know, but we propose all the different kinds of possibilities linked to sexual selection. But again, we don't know if the trait's coming in or being phased out. And now to the common, most common question that you're asked by your patients when they have all these tubes in their mouth and um, have a cup to spit in. So what did you get you? That seems to be a, a big gulf between marine biologists and, and dentistry. Yeah, I, I think there's, you know, probably a big gap there. But, you know, when you think about 
just the world of teeth, for example, a world that I'm in, this is really the one you would want an answer to because indeed in the things that don't make sense in our world around us, they're captivating, right? You're looking at them and you're going like, why? You know, you look at a giraffe and you think, why the long neck? I mean, you, I mean, sure you wanted to get higher leaves, but really, did you have to go through that extreme to do it? Couldn't you climb up there or figure out another way or so? I think, you know, in the world of teeth, this was one that was clearly unique. I mean, there's, there's nothing like it. And I always tell people in science, we're always reluctant to use superlatives, but with narwhal, fine and comfortable with many superlatives. But yet, when you got interested in there, there was very liter little literature in the science that actually described what it was used for, or even, you know, it, it, it almost looks like cables that are sort of wrapped tightly around each other. So, you know, what was the biggest surprise or secret that you found once you started studying them? Well, first, actually, in the literature, there was quite a bit out there, but it was all attached to kind of male-male rivalry. You know, these are the these are the boys, you know, duking it out for the for the best female, right? And obviously, with sexual selection, you can go to mate choice too. You know, maybe it's the guy that tells the good jokes that gets the girl, right? So when we think about how we decide in sexual selection, how we're going to choose our mate, there are different pathways to get there. But basically the biggest moment where, you know, as the National Geographic filmmakers say, what was the aha moment, right? And that moment came really earlier than our subsequent paper, but this came around 2005 when we were looking at it with a scanning electron microscope and saw these openings along the entire tusk, which completely shocked us because we don't see these tubules being exposed to the outer surface. We do in pathology for humans, for example, um, but we don't see it normally in teeth like this. So that was the first indication that, wow, is this an open communication between the outside and inside nerve of this tooth? And so it, it, looking at it as something that has quite a few nerves in it, um, how would you see that it's it evolved for the environment that they're in? They're, they're found up in the high Arctic. Am I yeah. Correct? yeah, they are. And it's completely counterintuitive. It's the, actually the last environment you would think you would want to have open patent tubules to an external Arctic environment, right? I mean, you've got cold air and even colder water oftentimes. You know, why on earth would you want to communicate in that environment? If anything, you'd want to insulate yourself from that environment, right? And, you know, narwhal, interestingly enough, in addition to their tooth being a little counterintuitive, you know, their skin is also very thin for an Arctic marine mammal, extremely thin. Their blubber is thick, but the skin is so thin. So, you know, in the world of nature, you got to think like, wow, what, what made this animal go this direction, you know? And, and I always say that, you know, with a lot of whales, particularly their teeth, somehow they missed the boat on evolution. You know, they, they got to the dock, the boat was taken off, they just didn't get on there. Um, so you have to wonder why they developed these. My other favorite example is, is a strap tooth whale. It's off the coast of New Zealand, only has two lower teeth and they wrap around the upper jaw, preventing the whale from opening its mouth. I mean, what animal would do this? You know, why, why would you develop teeth that prohibits you from opening your mouth. And those are the only two, by the way, that that whale has. Um, and likewise, the narwhal is equally, you know, inquisitive this way. I mean, why? Well, I mean, I guess there's a lot of questions to ask. And I would ask, you know, as a kid, did you always dream of being a dentist or looking and studying narwhals? No, none of those uh, were on my radar screen. So as a kid, I was really gravitating towards two different areas. One was music. I loved music. I wanted to be actually at one point an orchestra conductor. So while other kids were out in the playground, I was listening to classical music with a baton and actually conducting. I, I remember vividly those moments. And at the same time, I was interested in becoming a heart surgeon. And I was very directed as a kid. You know, this, was, this wasn't someone that was like a teenager in deciding this. This was someone who was like six or seven years old. My, my first words really to my parents were piano. You know, it, 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 it was no other word. And they, they were just, 
you know, like, what, what is this kid, you know, doing? I mean, how did he get in our lives kind of thing, you know? And for people who have children, you know, sometimes you end up with someone who doesn't have a clue. And sometimes you end up with a kid who just remarkably has a sense of where and what they need. Um, and so my parents were hounded by a kid at two who was just constantly asking for a piano. So they finally reluctantly brought me to a teacher at four years old and said, is this too early? And the teacher said, no, if he's that, you know, confident and he's that disciplined to know what he wants, you know, let him have it. Martin, what is it that your parents did do for a living that, you know, it seems like many people have influences, but it seems like somehow you came out of the, the womb, you know, wired a little differently. Yeah, so both of my parents were hairdressers. Uh, it was heads of hair that put me through school. Uh, they both worked together in a, in a salon. The joke was that my father came out as an electrical engineer from the armed services and they passed a beauty shop and my mother made some comment that she would enjoy working there. And my father said, well, I, I can do that too. Um, and they had a bet. And, you know, my father indeed not only became a hairdresser, but he was president of the National Hairdressers Association. So um, he got about as far in hair as you possibly can get. But <laughs> do you, what, but, was the name, what was the name of the shop and where was it? it? It was called the Kingswood Beauty Shop. It was in West Hartford. Um, and he did lots of famous people's heads of hair. Um, and as they both said, and as I can attest to, um, you know, for women in the audience, uh, the next source of confidential information next to their psychologist is the hairdresser, right? I mean, the hairdresser knows probably more about people's lives than any other person in, in the woman's life. And when they make a choice, by the way, to move or gravitate to another location, typically the first person they're looking for is the hairdresser. You know, so this, I'm just trying to picture the eight-year-old you. Your parents are hairdressers. You're not throwing a football around. You're sitting there conducting music in your head and out there waving a, a bit of a wand there. You're thinking about heart surgery. Did you have a lot of friends as a kid? Absolutely. We had a great neighborhood and I did play sports. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't want to make it sound like I was a reckless, but you know, we had a very different kind of uh, environment. We were very lucky in the neighborhood um, we grew up. It was a it was kind of a circle where all the families had basically kids the same age. And we had just incredible discovery opportunities. You know, as kids, we built um, each tree houses that were connected by ladders in the trees. So we could go from tree house to tree house. We did this underground because there was a whole underground kind of sand formation next to this woods. Each kid built underground caves and we had candles that were in the tunnels between the caves. I mean, those, those kinds of experiences, you know, are pretty hard to come by, you know, even then it was hard to come by, but when I think about it now, I think what a treasure that was, right? Because it, it, it endeared your sense of exploration, of being out in the woods, out discovering. And I was, you know, everyone caught a different kind of animal. I was kind of the big frog catcher, you know? So that was my big thing, um, you know, catching frogs. And, and, and I loved outdoors. I loved being outdoors. I loved being a part of it. So keep in mind that the heart surgeon guy and the guy waving the wand was also equally comfortable walking in the woods. You know, we, we, we were sort of talking about the unicorn being the, the magical, mythical creature. It sounds like the Martin Nouia is the magical, mythical creature. <laughs> um, I mean, that's incredible because I meet a lot of driven parents, driven to have their kids succeed. And yet it seems like so much effort on every activity, but it seems like that this sort of feral, um, you know, kind of existence just manifests itself in so many wonderful ways that you, you, you don't have a book that ever teaches you that. Yeah, and you know, uh, I mean, you're, maybe you're familiar with Richard Louv's Last Child in the Woods sure. you know, type of book, but you know, if you just leave kids alone, um, their imagination has to work. You know, if you're, a, if you're a parent, you know, what they call the helicopter parents are hovering over them and you're always feeding them, you know, the next great, wonderful thing that you envision their life is going to unfold with, um, you don't initiate that sense of imagination for them. I think kids should be bored. Um, you know, I have a daughter. If she's bored, I say be comfortable in your boredom. 
or, or if they're doing some kind of a game, I said, you know what, put it down and just look out the window. You know, don't, don't do anything. Your, your life doesn't have to be uh, always active, always kind of on. Um, that you need, these, you need these points in life where you're just, you're just looking at a bird or you're just watching a tree or, you know, just the simple things in life initiate, I think, a greater sense of imagination and outreach than all the things you can throw at someone. You know, it's interesting, you, you mentioned that book. I think the term that he coined was nature deficit disorder. Absolutely. And it, and it seems like not only children, but parents are suffering, you know, for the first time really in humankind, it's more interesting for some kids to be inside on a video game than to go outside. That was punishment for me. Well, yeah, and you, I, I'm sure you know, you know, Jeff Green, because you were there during, you know, an award ceremony that he did with all the kids that he brings up to the uh, Arctic. And I remember Jeff and I were talking one time and he said, you know, we had one of the first visits when kids would come with their, you know, paraphernalia, iPhones, you know, what, whatever electronics there were. And there was a bowhead whale that came up behind them and everybody was like, oh my God, there's a bowhead. And he said, half the kids missed it. They weren't even paying attention. And he said, after that instant, he said, I decided never again where am I going to allow a kid with any electronic appliance come on these kind of trips. So you're referring to Jeff Green from Students on Ice. And Correct. it just so happens I was on that trip with him. It was actually over Christmas break to Antarctica. And there was this, as you mentioned, uh, pod of whales there. The marine biologists started crying. And there were certain kids who wouldn't get off their Game Boy apparatuses or whatever they're playing to look out the door. And I know as a result of that, Students on Ice no longer allows electronic uh, devices. I was actually on that boat and I remember that incident. That's great. You know, and it's, it's, it's a wise decision, you know, just, just leave it alone. You're, you're in the most incredible show on the planet. You don't need another show to distract you from it. You know, when, when we're out, I mean, I live out in the country, right? So when, when we see a, a great rainstorm or a great cloud formation, that's the best show in town. You don't have to go pay a ticket for anything. Yeah, I often say the best reality show is really happening. So now you're the kid who wants to be the conductor, the heart surgeon. Where did, how did life bend into narwhals and dentistry? So when I traveled through the educational process, um, I obviously gravitated toward, you know, the sciences. I stayed a little bit with music, but not as a formal training. I always did it as something on the side. So I had a band, for example, um, in high school. I had a band in college. Um, and I continued writing music and even to this day, you know, continue to write music. So it's always been a part of my life. With the science thread, that led in some pretty interesting directions. So I started out with a heart surgery concept and then I realized, you know, to become a really good heart surgeon, you have to devote really most of your life to that. This isn't something you can do kind of on the side while you're doing other things. This is a really full investment of time and energy and effort. And I wasn't that invested, but I still wanted to be in the sciences. And dentistry offered that unique combination of art and science that really I gravitated to very much. And I liked it a whole lot. And then I really had a pivotal moment, I think, when I got my first fellowship at the Smithsonian. Um, this was when I was in dental school and I studied with um, a gentleman who then became the director of the National Museum of Natural History, a guy named Don Ortner, who was an incredible mentor for me. Um, great guy, extremely knowledgeable and opening up a world of research to me that I had never really seen before. And we got along famously. He, you know, we both, you know, could sense, you know, kind of that, that friendship, if you will. And every time I would go back to the museum, I would always say hello to him. He's since passed away, but that kind of geared me towards research and teeth. And then from there, you know, cause I was focused at that time in dental anthropology. So I did a lot of my first papers in dental anthropology. And then I started using animal examples uh, in my slideshows. And I realized when I started incorporating the narwhal, you know, I would just do some peripheral reading. And I just thought like, I don't think so. You know, I, like this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't believe this animal developed this thing to fight, you know? Um, and so the more research I did, the more questions it led to. And, 
you know, then in 2000, I decided to devote all my energy and effort in research to finding out what this whale was doing with this unexplainable tooth to me. And, and where, did, where did you first see one? I first saw one in Pond Inlet. You know, I had gone on my first expedition, not really knowing anybody. I had talked to the head of the Hunters and Trappers Organization in Pond Inlet, flew up there by myself. And this is uh, up in Canada. Correct, in the high Arctic of Canada, uh, on Baffin Island, in the uh, northeastern part of Baffin Island. And I stayed in the house of uh, an Inuit family um, that, you know, I kind of found on my own. I didn't want to stay in a hotel. My sense when I'm traveling to some place that's, you know, I think is unexplored or I don't want to be the average, you know, kind of southerner or Hailunat as they refer to us. I wanted to be seen differently. So, um, and I got introduced to an incredible hunter there who was head of their um, search and rescue and I befriended him. And from there, it just, you know, kept leading to other opportunities. It's interesting that you mentioned a hunter because um, generally some of the best experts I've seen on animals are not only hunters, but often poachers because they sit there and they study the uh, habitat and the habits of these creatures in which uh, they hunt. And so I would imagine that, I'm assuming these people are Inuit, that they gave you information and observation that you had not read about. You're absolutely correct. Hunters have a very strong instinct about animal behavior and they see them in extremes, right? Because they're hunting them. So it's kind of their wit against the animals. So in terms of, let's say, diving depths, for example, if you look in the literature about narwhal diving and how long they can basically hold their breath, you'll typically read 20 minutes to 30 minutes. The hunter will say, oh no, because they've waited there. They've, they've actually been there waiting because uh, they're looking for that as an opportunistic moment. And for them, it's more like a little over 45 minutes. So um, you get those kind of details indeed from the very fact that they are hunters. Martin, it, you know, you have dabbled in a, a lot of interesting arts, the arts of science and the arts of, of, of music. Do you feel that any of those skills sort of spill into the other and, and it changes your approach to life in general. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, all of it, I feel, is integrative. Every part of your life experience somehow gets incorporated into your perception of how you see, visualize, um, even respond you know, to your environment. And in my case, especially because I cross different disciplines, particularly with the music, um, you know, it, it put me in different environments in a very different way had I not had that, for example. So um, I was with a group in a very remote part of Yap in Micronesia and, um, you know, lo and behold, I was doing dental research and, you know, someone midway, they only have one generator on the whole island, by the way. And this is a, a three day trip from Yap, if any of you know the geography. And this was back in the 1980s. And you know, they asked me if I wanted to play in their band. Um, that led to a whole different direction of, of a cultural in, if you will, because then people were my friends. It was a whole different level of relationship than it was as a scientist. And, and music draws people. You know, If you're there and they sense your spirit, even if you're not responding. So with the Inuit, for example, if I'm witness because their song is critical to how they see their world. When I was up in Kanak in Greenland, um, you know, roughly about 10 years ago, they actually wrote a song for me, you know, because they, they, they saw the research I was doing, they understood that music was an integral part of me. And it, you know, it, that kind of is resounding, right? I mean, if, if you have someone that's kind of honoring what you do in a medium that you understand, it, it's, it's about the most gratitude you can express. So that, that, that's quite a, um, an honor to have a song. So do, do you, was it named or do you know any of the I, lyrics? I, no, I can't. I wouldn't even know how to sing the, the lyrics. Um, it was all in Greenlandic, but it was celebrating my arrival, you know, because narwhal is a very heralded animal, you know, pan-Arctic, right? So they, um, it's very spiritual, you know, these animals. They all have spirit entities for them. 
Um, and even though they're hunted, I think very few people outside of that environment really understand how sacred these animals are. You know, they, they are taught to say thank you, you know, when they have a prey because they understand that this is something they're utilizing for subst you know, sustenance in a way that they need this food. It's not because they're doing it to, to take a spirit, it's doing it to you know, kind of keep their spirit alive. So they say thank you, you know, in that sense. Um, so hunting has a very different kind of perception there. What, what, do you, what do you think in your journeys or at least staying with these families, especially up, I think you've spent the most time in Canada, What's the biggest takeaway that you've had from them? Boy, um, two biggest, two big takeaways. Um, I, I would say uh, the, the biggest one, and I've seen this with indigenous cultures um, throughout the world that I've spent time. I've, you know, I've been in the Amazon, I've been in, in the, you know, Micronesia um, and the high Arctic are the three main places. But the biggest one is that you have to live from your heart. Um, we're trained in Western society to really focus on the brain a little too much. Um, you know, kindness is a, is a big value. Um, you know, how you respect, how you honor, um, how you express gratitude, um, all these elements from your heart, how you love, um, these are the important things in life. You know, I, I, I always, you know, tell my own daughter, what you do in life won't impress me, who you are will, you know, so that people understand that, that these are values that you need to approach in your, in your life. And, and so taking those values, I've often, I used to live in New York City. And so I would come back from a trip, say to Africa, and I would have been maybe with the Hadzabi, which is a stone age um, hunter gatherer society in Tanzania. And so to come back to New York society, where it seemed that there were so many first world problems or things that were very trivial, do, how do you sort of grapple with that? Because you have people who, again, the dentist is sort of like the barber. People are telling you very first world problems. Has it changed your approach? Do you, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand how you reconcile those worlds. You know, it's interesting when you ask that question because it made me think of exactly the reverse. So you were talking about your return from a trip from that group of people to sure. New York. So I had um, the privilege, and twice I remember this. So the first time um, I was in the High Sierras in Colombia, and I was uh, at that time um, living with a group that descended from the Tyrone Indians, the, the Kogi Indians. And um, they had uh, a sacred priestess there and she had a heart ailment. So she had to go to Bogota to be you know, cured from this. And so interestingly enough, I was with her son. It was the first time he had ever seen anything outside of his very remote village in the high Sierras in Colombia, first time. So I'm walking with him through kind of this busy department store. And I remember thinking, I wonder what his reaction is going to be. And then being shocked at what his reaction was. And his reaction, you know, I, I was doing my whole thing like, oh, I bet he's going to, you know, wonder, wow, this is cool or this is impressive. And honestly, if I had to translate the expression on his face, it would say, why would a culture do this? Why would they live like this? And I had the same privilege when I brought Inuit to Paris. Um, imagine an Inuit conference in Paris, France, right? So now you're taking people who are coming from a high remote village in the Arctic to Paris, France. I thought the same thing. Oh, they're going to be interested in the food. They're going to be interested. And, you know, the, they just kind of missed home, you know? Um, and I, I found that very interesting, you know, because we're always brought up with opportunity, how you see the next thing, um, you know, always kind of, you know, in motion, if you will, with our minds. And theirs was much more centered. You know, um, I find it interesting, you know, and you probably have seen this as well, but when you interview them, you know, we, cause we did this with elder interviews, they're very well-spoken. I mean, they, they know how to approach a camera. They're real, they're in front of you and you feel their presence more so than, you know, the Kailuna, like us, you know, if we were interviewed, 
you know, you can tell we're thinking about something else or, you know, the, it's hard to get people present, right? I mean, y y even if you're at a dinner or something to really get someone and you go like, are you really there? Are you in the moment? Um, we have a hard time being in the moment and they don't, they live in the moment. Um, so I, I think these were the lessons and I, I, it's just interesting that you brought that out and triggered the reverse for me is how they would be in our environment. Well, you know, it's interesting. We, I had a guest um, just yesterday. His name is David Good. His mother was uh, born in the Amazon in a, in a very remote uh, Amazonian tribe. And she did come um, back to New Jersey where uh, his father was from. But the, the observation that she made is somewhat similar, that people would walk by and not say hello or acknowledge everybody. And she missed the group dynamic of a family. And I think that there are so many social and mental maladies in, in the United States, that's where we live, that would be cured if people had a support structure of family around them. And so the biggest observation I've met from the world of happiness is that it seems that being part of a group where you know those people know you and care. You're somebody within that group. Absolutely, and certainly within subsistence cultures, you need them too. You 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 depend on them actually, and you know we have a large problem in this country. You know, three of the top university presidents were asked what the biggest problem on campus was. They all said the same thing: loneliness. They said, you know, we have all these kids that are attached onto electronic devices, and the social interaction between you know, how they just interact from person to person um, is being diffused with all this electronics. You know, I, I've had this happen to, you know, to me, you know, when I'm meeting investigators, my first instinct is to call them. I mean, that, that's, I, I've just always thought it's better to introduce yourself and say a little about who you are, hear something from them. And sometimes I find it disarming for the other side. You know, I, I'm thinking like, they're probably thinking like, why didn't you email me, you know, or, and, I, and so I, <laughs> I'm just caught in this, you know, kind of parallel um, position where you where you're exposed to these kind of cultures who are kind of in the moment, living from their heart, being transposed to your environment where everyone is kind of brain oriented and a little bit more detached and having a harder time getting in touch with us. I mean, look at the look at the self help books in a bookstore. I mean, do you think the average indigenous culture would even think of a self help book? I mean, that, that, that conceptually is probably, you know, so distant for them. Martin, it was interesting when I was thinking about speaking with you, and, and we only have a couple more moments, is I was going to ask you the, about the magic of the real unicorn, the narwhal versus the mythical one. But in some regard, after speaking to you, I think that the magic really has been in the transformation of the experience of being in their environment. And their environment does include indigenous people, the Inuit in, in that per ca uh, particular case. So it, it seems like the entire environment of that area has been magical. I mean, you, you started by saying the best reality shows are really happening, but it seems like that type of transformation for you has been very eye-opening. Yeah, indeed it has. And, I, and I've you know been more recently studying kind of how people process knowledge and information and, and knowledge models. And I always say that, you know, we're taught to be reductionist in science, right? We're looking for the single variable. How do we get rid of everything else? Most indigenous people really are contextual. They, they see everything interlocked. You know, they are the original sustainable peoples. You know, we're all learning that now, right? I mean, now you have all these sustainable conferences. Uh, how can we do renewable energy? I mean, these are the people that, that have lived this lifestyle um, and I think are the original ones to, you know, kind of adopt it. So we certainly can learn from them, but I think you're correct. Um, these environments are just so enticing. I mean, it's not just because I haven't been there and it's a new environment, but you realize that all of the other distractions in your life are removed. And every time I've been there, and I've had this happen with other researchers, I have dreams from distant past memories. And I, and, I, and I thought like, wow, this is wild that I'm dreaming about this. And I brought up two other investigators and they had the exact same experience. 
and you know, because I first thought it was just me, you know, and I just thought like, what, what initiates this? Why? And, and I think that's what a mind is trying to do. While we're living our lives, our mind is trying to catch up and assimilate everything. And that's why I say the thing with children. I think children need to slow down, actually. They need less stuff, less things, um, and, and have a chance for their brain to kind of just be okay, be relaxed, you know, be comfortable, you know, where they are and how they're learning. I, I, I think it was an article in National Geographic I read about you and the advice you gave now to your eight-year-old self was to just live life and be yourself. And it, and it seems that that's something you, you did. It seems like you have chosen life on your own terms and not necessarily going with the predicted or the safe or the um, what society was doing around you. Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable walking out on a limb that I think could very well break, you know, and I think, you know, if, I mean, I sail as well. And I always tell people, the only way you're really going to know how to sail is if you tip the boat over, right? I mean, because you don't know the extent of what that thing can do. Um, and it's not to say that you have to have tragedy in your life to somehow understand the reality of what it is. But failure is the thing that brings innovation. Failure is the thing that brings creativity. You know, without understanding what failure is, what taking something too far might be, or, or an incorrect position, you never really know how to innovate and change. And I think those are also the lessons that have been taught to me over time to say, hey, you know what? I can be even more comfortable, you know, because you, you give yourself the privilege to fail. You, you say, it's okay. It's not... You know, and if I made a mistake, hey, you know, if I did it to a person, I apologize. Or if I did it for a research entity and I have to backtrack, I mean, look at Albert Einstein. He apologized for his first theory of relativity. He said, I got it wrong. I'm sorry. You know, I, so I think there's room in everything to understand what failure does, how it transforms your life, and indeed be yourself. Martin, I'd like to think of you as a Renaissance man, but I also think you may be the world's coolest dentist. <laughs> well, Mark. I do. I do have patients that leave my office, and and, <laughs> and exactly say that they 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 say I have the coolest dentist on the planet, and, and um, I believe that. Mark, <laughs> listen, thank you for being a guest on Life's Tough, but Explorers Are Tougher. Thank you, Richard. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>